uh, we should get started again. Uh, okay. Okay. So yeah. so let's continue. Um, and edge, yeah. Uh, so I am going to uh, to use my pen to point to the place. So right. So we had this sheaf of conformal block. Now one important theorem is. So let's assume that. Can you? Okay. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Does that work? A little bit to the left towards the mouse. Yes. Okay. And that was worse. Uh, I think oh, that I it was. That you were also moving the camera sometimes. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. How about that? Is it worse? Now I can see T belongs to capital T and geometric uh, with C. Right, right. But okay, okay. How about that? Uh, that's worse. Okay, now? Uh, now I can see geomet geome uh, where I could see geometric before. Okay, but theorem, can you read the theorem? Yes. Okay, okay. All Assume right. that T is smooth and pi is a smooth morphism. Yes, yes, I, I can see the, the theorem. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, so that's where we are. So let's assume that this parameter family of S pointed curves has the property that T is smooth. I assume already T is smooth. And pi is a smooth morphism. Earlier, we only asked it to be a proper and flat family. But now let's assume that actually it's a proper and a smooth morphism. Then what happens? So then, okay, so can you see it? Uh, it still needs to go, yeah, yeah, that's better, that's better. That's better? Actually, right, right, okay. So this is space, now this is the, the uh, some sheaf over T. So this sheaf admits a projectively flight connection. So this sheaf, which is a sheaf over T, and T is a smooth variety now. So this sheaf admits a projectively flat connection. In particular, V sigma T, this family is a vector bundle over T. So when you have a, a, a variety and you have some, some coherent sheaf over that, which admits a, a, a projectively flat connection or a flat connection, then that sheaf becomes actually a locally free sheaf. So this uh, sheaf of conformal block now becomes a vector bundle. And the consequence it has that the dimension of this one only depends upon the genus of sigma and the weight lambda. So it does not depend upon the choice of the actual curve within that genus. Let's take, let's say that sigma was smooth. So, so it does not depend upon the choice of the curve sigma within that genus. And it does not depend upon the choice of the points, the, the marked points there, because given any other marked point, you can move in a smooth proper family to go from one set of points to another set of marked points and from one particular curve within that genus to another curve because the moduli of uh, genus G curves uh, is connected. So you can go from one genus G curve to another genus G curve. And also you can go from one set of mark points to another set of mark points. So this theorem has a very important consequence that this dimension does not depend upon the choice of actual curve within that genus. And, uh, but it does depend upon the, the weights and the genus. So now I'm going to introduce this notation, mg lambda vector, which is the dimension of V sigma P lambda. And I, I said it does not depend upon the choice of sigma within that genus and the choice of the mark points. But mark points have to be smooth. Now let's observe a corollary of the factorization theorem. So what it says that mg lambda is same as mg minus one lambda, but you attach two more points, mu star and mu. I mean, wait, mu star and mu, and you run over mu in DC. So let's write here. 
so uh, so we run over all dc so mg lambda is now mg minus 1 lambda mu star mu and you keep going inductively and you you get to m0 lambda but you have introduced 2g many points 2g time uh, uh, two times g many points and the weights mu and star mu and mu two star mu two mu g star mu g where each mu i is an element in dc so this one sum which we are interested in has become a, a, a sum of all these quantities but the advantage is that we need to make the calculation on a genus zero curve which is p1 now there is right now actually here I have slopped over one small point that when I'm going from mg to mg minus one, we have to introduce a node in the curve and then we have to normalize it. And what I said that this dimension only depends upon the genus, that was only for the smooth curves, but actually what happens that there is some extension of this result, which says that the theorem remains true even for uh, non-smooth curves as long as they have only uh, 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 nodal points. Uh, so those are called the stable curves. Okay, so 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 that's what I'm remarking. Let's remark that the low, uh, last theorem remains valid when T is the moduli space of S-pointed stable curves. So, so I stated the theorem only for a smooth family, but actually this uh, result remains true for the moduli space of S-pointed stable curves. And then what happens that this, uh, this uh, 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 coherent sheaf of conformal blocks is becomes a vector bundle, not only on the family of smooth curves, but also on the whole modelized space of this pointed stable curves. Okay, now let's see. Is it visible the last line? The very it's last line is missing. The point. stuff above is out what? to the left, out to to the right. Okay. Yes. So let's see further by uh, the factor. Ah, okay, okay, okay. No, 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 no. I, I. Yeah. I, now, I, now we can see. Yes. Correct. 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 Actually, now I should. Yeah. Yeah. Now I figured out that I can see it. Some picture. Okay. So now, so the problem of calculating this dimension mg lambda reduced to a problem of computing M0, that is on P1, but million more points now, because it will depend upon genus. So if genus is 1000, then we have to attach 2000 points. And of course the original lambda. And then we have to sum over all these weights. So that becomes a very large sum. So the question is, have we really gained anything? And the answer is yes. So the factorization theorem is also valid. So what we do, we take P1 and we, 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 we deform P1 to make a I node. I think there. you got out of view now. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Right, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, sorry. One minute. No, one minute. Let, let's. Ah, right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, it's good. Yeah, 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 correct, correct. Okay, so what we have done, we take P1 and we pinch it so that we introduce one node point. And now the factorization theorem is, is still available for this situation. And when, when we normalize, we don't get a connected P1, we get two copies of P1, where this node point has become one point on one P1 and another point on another P1. And let's analyze this situation. And we can apply the factorization theorem again. Let's see. Uh, right. Right. Yeah, it's visible now. Yes. So we can apply the factorization theorem again. And now we take M0 as many points. And we can break it into M0, lambda 1, lambda 2, and mu, and M0, mu star, and rest lambdas, lambda 3, lambda s. S could be any number. So I have broken this number into product of two numbers. One number has only three points, and another number has 
S minus two plus one points. So S minus one points, but still I have to sum over DC. Now we can inductively do this process and this M zero with 1 million points becomes product of things with three points only. Of course, the, the, it will still be a big sum, but now we only have to understand in, in theory and actually in practice, M zero with three points and three weights attached to that. So if we apply factorization theorem successively, so first we have reduced from Mg to M zero, and now M zero with several points, I have reduced it to M zero with three points. Okay. So now this tells us that we are reduced to calculating M0, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. And this is achieved by the fusion product on level C, level C representations of G. Now this thing is guided by what is called the fusion product at level C. So fusion product is, uh, okay, I mean, maybe all of you know about that, but uh, just, just like tensor product of two representations, we can define fusion product of two representations at level C. And then uh, this is not tensor product, this is fusion product. So what we get is only representations at level C. So we discard some representations which have level more than C, but also we have to discard some mirror images of that. So, so let's just say that. I'm not being very precise there, but fusion product of two representations at level C, is like tensor product, but it produces only components of level C, and it discards all the representations of level more than C, but also it discards some, some representations which are mirror images under the affine while group of C. Okay, so, so this is the end of it. So we wanted to calculate mg of lambda bar or lambda vector, and now this problem has reduced into calculating M0, that means on P1 with three points, where it's guided by the fusion product. And in fact, it's not only a theoretical reduction, this becomes really a very uh, calculable problem. And in fact, there is a very closed expression. I am not writing down the closed expression for Mg lambda, uh, but it's a very, very precise closed expression, very similar to the wild character formula. Uh, but probably it's uh, not much uh, interest to really write down that formula. But I'm saying that there is a very precise formula which comes out of that for any MG lambda. Now, let me say very briefly the history here. So as I said, this conjecture was made in 1988. He made a precise conjecture. And then Shuchia, Yuno, and Yamada in 1989 they made a major progress in this project, major, major progress. And then I'm just going to list some of the names. So Bowie Laszlo in 94, they did some work for SLN. Faltings did for nine, in 94 for General G. Myself, Narsimhan and Ramanathan, we did something in 94. And Pauli did it for the parabolic case in 96. Laszlo Sorger did it for the moduli stack in 97. And then Bismut and Laburi did it in 93, actually. Direct proof for holomorphic sections, which I have not really talked about, but they have restrictions on the weights. And then there was some contribution by Telemann in 97. And then for SL2, actually, it predates all these works. Bertram, Zenas, and Tidius did it for 91, 93, and 94, but for group SL2. Now, what I have not talked about for lack of time, that there is a completely parallel picture for the space of conformal blocks. Maybe, maybe I am again out of sync. Ah, right. Yes. Yes, good. Yeah. So there is a parallel picture for the space of conformal blocks in terms of holomorphic sections of line bundles on the moduli space are moduli stack of semi-stable parabolic bundles on sigma. So I, I will have no time to explain more about this thing, but this is space of dual conformal block or conformal block is canonically isomorphic with the space of, uh, 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 space of holomorphic sections of certain line bundles on the moduli space are moduli stack 
of semi-stable parabolic bundles on sigma. Uh, and that makes this whole theory even more interesting for classical algebraic geometers because this uh, uh, line bundles on the modelized space of G bundles was studied for a very long time and its dimension was a mystery. But with this work, now you can calculate the dimension in a very precise manner. And uh, because this space becomes isomorphic with the space of conformal block. Okay, so any questions so far? Anybody? So actually, I see that I have 10 minutes. And now, as, as I said, I am going to, uh, so this is, so, so far this was not really, I mean, there, there, there was some part of it was done by me with other collaborators uh, and several other people. But now what I'm going to talk about is a work with Juju. And this is the Galois picture. So I'm going to very briefly talk about that. Let's see. No. Yeah, now we can see the first half at least. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so what is the Galois picture? So earlier we took a reduced projective curve sigma, but now what we are going to do, we are going to take still a reduced projective curve, but with the action of a finite group gamma. So we let a finite group uh, a gamma act on sigma and let sigma bar be the quotient of sigma by this action of gamma. Uh, now we assume that any gamma, I mean, it's a technical assumption and we can even gloss over that, but let's say that we assume that any element in gamma other than one does not fix any irreducible component of sigma point wise. I mean, it's a technical assumption. You, 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 may, you may just forget about that. So the requirement is that sigma basically does not act trivially on any irreducible component of, uh, of sigma. Now, as before, we are going to take a simple Lie algebra over complex numbers. Now, except that now gamma is also acting on G as Lie algebra automorphisms. So gamma is acting first of all on the curve sigma and gamma is acting on the Lie algebra G. And we have one technical restriction for at least some of the results. So let me say, it, but some, many of the results are true without this restriction. So we, 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 we assume that gamma is fixing a Borel subalgebra in G. That's not automatic, but if sigma, so, sorry, if gamma were a cyclic group, then it's automatic that it will fix the Borel subalgebra. But otherwise it's not automatic. So we just put that assumption. And as I said, this assumption is for some of the results, which I'm going to talk about, not for all the results. Okay, so now we want to talk about this twisted conformal blocks. So a S-pointed gamma curve is by definition, again, just like last time, sigma with bunch of distinct points. These are smooth points. Uh, these are distinct smooth points, but we also require that gamma orbits do not intersect. So gamma PI is not equal to gamma PJ for the I different from J. Now to PI, Earlier, we attached the same simple Lie algebra, uh, uh, sorry, same affine Lie algebra. But now to each PI, we are going to associate not the same affine Lie algebra, but a twisted affine Lie algebra. Okay, so what is this twisted affine Lie algebra? So let's take the isotropy of gamma at PI. So I think we are out of view now. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. I see that. I see that. Sorry. I see that. I see. That. Yeah, no, I think it's okay. Yeah, that's no, right. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So I take gamma pi isotropy of gamma at pi, and I take g hat as before, but now I'm taking its twisted analog. So g hat at pi is nothing but g hat, and now gamma pi, the isotropic group, acts here, and we are going to take the fixed point there. So this is what is called the twisted affine Lie algebra. If you are familiar with the theory. So G hat was the usual affine Lie algebra, but now we are going to take, now gamma PI, okay, I should mention that, gamma PI is a finite, I mean, gamma was a finite group and it's isotropy. So of course it's finite, 
But actually, it turns out that gamma PI is a, a cyclic group because PI were smooth points. So the isotropic group uh, is a cyclic group. And this is what is called the, the twisted affine algebra. So now to the point PI, we are going to as associate this twisted affine algebra, not the affine algebra. Okay. So the next thing is, now we are going to take, okay, so let's see. So now I'm going to take integrable highest uh, weight module, not for the affine Lie algebra, but for the twisted affine algebra, which I'm, I'm denoting by G hat PI. And this has its own parameterization, which I'm just denoting by DC PI. Now C is fixed is still the central charge. I am not changing the central charge. Central charge is fixed for all the PI, but this DC PI depends upon the choice of PI. And now I'm going to take lambda vector, lambda one through lambda s, where lambda i is now in DCPI. That means the corresponding h of lambda i is not a representation of g hat, but it's a representation of g hat pi. So it's still it's the integrable highest weight module for the twisted affine Lie algebra at pi with highest weight lambda i and central charge c. And now again, as, uh, earlier, I take their tensor product, h lambda one tensor h lambda s. But mind that h lambda i is not a module for same g hat, but for g hat pi. Okay, right. So, so I'm just remarking that h lambda uh, a vector is a module for g hat p1 direct sum direct sum g hat ps, where the ith factor acts only on the ith factor here. Okay, so now I need to define the twisted dual conformal blocks. So to this curve sigma with the gamma action, the points, uh, the marked points P and the marked weights lambda, we have this V sigma, which depends upon the choice of the action of gamma P lambda. So this is called the space of twisted conformal block. And this is by definition, similar to earlier, but we take H lambda, but we divide by G of sigma minus not only P, but the whole gamma orbit of P. We remove the whole gamma orbit of P, but now we take the gamma invariants here in this uh, 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 algebra. And that acts on H lambda uh, vector, similar to the previous uh, uh, here. Now the action of, okay, it's again out of focus. So let's put it out of focus, right. So the action of G sigma minus gamma P on H lambda is as before, except that, Ah, okay, okay, no, 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 it's exactly as before. That we take a local parameter, and since I'm taking gamma invariant, the local parameter will push us to the twisted affine Lie algebra at that point, and we let that factor act on the H lambda i. Okay, so then we come to the lemma. So this is space of twisted conformal block is again finite dimensional. So we, and you're missing oh, the oh, sorry, right sorry, sorry, half sorry. of that no, lemma. No, 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 thanks, thanks, thanks. Yes, now we can see. Yeah, right, right. Okay, so this is space is again finite dimensional and it does not depend upon the choice of the local parameters Ti at Pi. Now theorems. And these are the results which uh, uh, I proved with Juju. So the analog of propagation of Waku, I'm not going to say exactly what it is in this setting, but analog of propagation of Waku is true. Factorization theorem remains valid, again, with, with proper uh, 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 formulation. Existence of projectively flat connection on a smooth family remains true. And in fact, let's see. And in fact, extension of the connection to the, what is called the Hurwitz stack, which I don't have time to explain. On Hurwitz stack, uh, it's similar to the moduli space, uh, 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 our moduli stack of curves, but now here it's moduli stack of curves together with the marked points, uh, PI with the, uh, the monodromy fixed at that point. So we are fixing uh, now two things. 
So we are fixing, uh, no, we are taking three things and putting them together, modularized space of genus G curves, points there, which are smooth points, and also we are fixing the monodromy at those points. And if we combine all three, then what we get is what is called the Hurwitz stack. And now this, there is extension of this connection, not only on the smooth family, but on this Hurwitz stack, which is not smooth, uh, but this connection has logarithmic singularity uh, uh, at the boundary. And then what we prove is that identification of twisted conformal block with the global section of some moduli stack which were conjectured by Pappas and Rapoport. So again, similar to the dual conformal block in the classical picture is identified with the global sections, the space of global sections on the moduli stack of G bundles with respect to some line bundle. So there is a very similar picture here where we identify the twisted conformal block with the global sections on some moduli stack, uh, which were conjectured by Pappas and Rapoport. And then we prove the precise dimension formula, very similar to the Verlinde dimension formula. And this was proved by me and Juju, and also independently by Deshpande and Mukhopadhyaya. In fact, Deshpande and Mukhopadhyaya proved it before us, but our method is, is very different, uh, uh, very geometric method. So we can see I, the bottom I, part. Actually, I am, up. yes, sorry. Yes, I am out of focus. I yes, correct, correct. Right. Yes, now we can see the yes, correct, bottom correct. part. So I just want to end yes. by saying there were earlier work in the twisted conformal block uh, before us by Frankel Zeni. I don't know how to pronounce this. Shesney. Yeah, okay, okay. And then Kurobi and Takobe and uh, uh, Kiera Demiolini. So there were some earlier works uh, in this direction. Uh, I will not say exactly what they did and uh, so on, but uh, actually I am over time by a few minutes, so I will stop here. Thanks very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, let's thank uh, Sravan.